Oh, I'm glad to see some people here in the audience. This is good. We have, um, uh, and I hope there's a bunch of people on, on the Zoom as well. There are, good. Uh, in case people don't know, I'm Raphael Hirsch. I'm the chair of the Department of Pediatrics. We have this year resumed live Grand Rounds. And I'm hoping that over the next uh, few weeks, people will get used to that idea and we'll, we'll get more and more people here. Uh, but it's a pleasure to have everybody here. And I am going to turn it over to Ted Rule to introduce our speaker. Ted is on Zoom because he's on his way somewhere overseas uh, <laughs> doing some research. So Ted, are, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Can, can you okay. hear me okay, Rafi? I'm, I'm, yes, I'm turning it over to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Rafi. And I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I had to uh, negotiate heavily to make sure I still got a chance to introduce uh, Monica. So um, I will begin that now. So um, Dr. Monica Gandhi, um, she is a professor of medicine and associate chief in the Division of HIV, Infectious Diseases and Global Medicines at UCSF. She's also director of the UCSF Center for AIDS Research and the medical director of the HIV clinic known for many years as Ward 86 at San Francisco General Hospital. Um, Monica is recognized globally for her research around women living with HIV and for pioneering work in methods to monitor medication adherence. She's also a fierce advocate for people living with HIV and a devoted clinician to her patients in SF. Monica has been an inspiration to me personally throughout my training in UCF, uh, UCSF around HIV. She's just, for her kind of for her clinic and for her trainees. She's devouring the pipeline of studies in HIV. She's able to rapidly evaluate new new data and translate kind of evidence into what should and should not change practice. She's respected for that throughout um, the HIV community at, at, at UCSF. And she's just one of these people, I just don't understand how she does what she does in the same kind of supposedly 24 hour days that, that I live in. Monica's responded to the COVID pandemic with the same rigor and zeal she has HIV. Um, she's written a number of op-eds around policies since the inception of the pandemic, grounded in principles of harm reduction that are based on her long experience with HIV. She's pushed to advance strategies of transmission mitigation, especially involving schools and around vaccinations, always driven by her own critical assessment of new evidence. I'm looking forward to what is sure to be a rich and thought-provoking presentation by her today. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Monica. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here um, with you all. And thank you so much, Ted. I really appreciate that kind introduction. Um, I'm gonna talk about the history of COVID actually, or at least what we know of the history. I'll talk about kind of the school issue because I have to. Um, <laughs> I'll talk about COVID vaccines and then I'll talk about COVID variants and why is this word endemic keep on coming up? Why did Biden say the pandemic's over then took it back and what, what does this mean? Um, so in terms of the history, you know, I think we're going to be seeing infectious disease enter human populations with increasing frequency, very unfortunately. And that really has to do with global warming, with climate change, with hosts, you know, uh, with, pa uh, sorry, pathogens moving to colder climes and encountering new hosts that they haven't seen before. Our interaction with animals and hunting and, and, and pets is really distorted. And um, if we don't regain this trust back in public health before the next pandemic, we're in trouble because we're going to see a next pandemic. We have agricultural practices that favor pathogens moving where they didn't used to be. Um, we are encroaching on animal habitats and then we move. We move, we're crowded. You know, when we banned um, travel from South Africa, when they told us about the Omicron variant, too late. It was already here um, and the travel is so quick. Um, and so this sort of, oh, sorry. Yes, I forgot that. So this sort of jet travel and how quickly we move. And then unfortunately, as been coming up with the monkeypox outbreak, the question of bioterrorism um, came up again with smallpox. So, so many reasons why um, we, need, we need to think about how to avoid pandemics and, pa and prepare for the next one. Where do we think this virus came from? Well, SARS was the, there was actually four times, there's seven coronaviruses. There are four common cold coronaviruses and there are three that were really bad. And in retrospect, one of the common cold coronaviruses called OC43 may have been the Russian flu in 1867. We have no way of knowing. But at any rate, the ones that we do know of, SARS. So 2002, 2003 caused severe disease. It was actually absolutely from bats, then went through an animal host called the palm civet, 
and then caused a pandemic. It was so much more limited than this one, though. It's 8,098 8, cases, 29 countries, 774 deaths. We had zero deaths here in the U.S. And that was SARS. Then the second time this happened with a coronavirus was MERS. And this was 2011. So this was Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It was um, also came from the horseshoe bat, went through the dromedary, and then went around the world, again, very limited, 2494 cases, but it was very deadly, 858 deaths. And then we had two cases here in healthcare workers. And then SARS-CoV-2. And when did we know about this? Okay, December 31st, 2019, there was an event that the WHO was told about this virus. By January 7th, the WHO already knew it was a coronavirus. By May, January 30th, it was called a global health emergency. And by March 11th, 2020, that was the first day it was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. And where did it come from? Um, it it likely came from something to do with animals. Uh, there was the bat, then there's the Wuhan wet market, and we just have to leave it at that because we haven't yet found the, anim the specific animal host. But I think for me, this actually explains it best is when um, Jane Goodall spoke at our international AIDS meeting with us in 2020, where she said, no matter what happened, it is our treatment with animals has to improve. It has to, it's, it's responsible for the HIV epidemic, which was the bushmeat trade. It's responsible in some way for COVID-19. And I think this is the warning personally to the planet. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about children and COVID and actually pandemic playbooks. Um, so this was a strange thing about COVID. This is not true of measles or polio or many other infections, which usually infect the very young and the very old and cause severe disease in those populations. This in general spared, spared children from severe disease. And the reason, we knew that from Wuhan early on in February, 2020, but the reason I'm showing you UK data and not US data is the, and there was just a piece in the New York Times two days ago, the US in general has had a harder time with data transparency and collection. And part of that is actually our fragmented healthcare system. You have a unified health service like, like UK, you can really sort of come up with what's going on. So in the UK, March 20th to February, 2021, there are 12 million children who are under 18 in England. And of those, 3,105 died from all causes during that time period, and 25 of those were from SARS-CoV-2. And then 22 was um, due to COVID, uh, 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 was due to MISC, and then in general, they updated their analysis, and over the first two years of the pandemic, either from MISC or COVID, 81 children um, across this first two years of the pandemic in the UK. Uh, that makes it 99.995% of children who are under 18 with a positive COVID test survived. And that's very different than adults uh, over 50, which is a 99% survival rate. So it was a very vast difference in terms of um, the survival rates, which is so different, right, from measles, polio, other infections that tend to really infect the young. This is probably the best CDC data we can get. They actually had, an, um, unfortunately, had some data problems, and then, and then a couple months ago, uh, two, two months ago, they um, downgraded the pediatric deaths by 25% because they had had some data transparency problems, and it ended up. It, it's also kind of around the same proportion of deaths. Um, anyone less than 18.1% of deaths, and then that's true here in California as well, from our data collection less than 0.1% of COVID deaths occurred in the population less than 18. So why did this happen? Because I think that, you know, we definitely didn't see this in 1918. Actually, the 1918 influenza pandemic not only affected children, but really young men, like young people, it was really different in the military and what was happening in World War I. And I think the main reason is that the immune response has a huge role to play in pathology. So the, one of the first reasons that was postulated why children were so much less at risk had to do with the fact that the receptor density of the ACE2 receptor that imbibes, you know, brings in COVID was in lower densities in children, and it was like even lower, less than 10. But I think that it's actually this data um, by um, 
Albert Einstein that explains it the best, which has to do with if you your innate immune response is actually very responsible for the pathology of COVID. And children have higher levels of interferon gamma, interleukin 17. These alert the immune system quickly to the pathogen and they have very high levels in the airways so that it can't go down deeper. I think this is the best immunologic reason and I would really refer you to their work because it's it's been, I think, the clearest explanation of why children were so much less at risk. Even if they were more at risk than adults, it's probably informative to look at the history of school closures in pandemics. So measles, diphtheria definitely affect ch young children very severely. Um, it was always that, you know, we didn't have remote learning, so that's important to say we didn't have computers, but it was always part of a pandemic playbook to open schools as quickly as you can because of the importance of schools for children. And then I think this was a, uh, this was the 2006 um, pandemic influenza plan. This was basically saying, okay, if we have another pandemic, this was put out by the, um, by Homeland Security, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with schools? What are we going to do with adults? What are we going to do? And this was the place when people say it was never part of a pandemic playbook to school, close schools, where there's so much discussion about how important schools are for children. And in 1918, I think it was very um, interesting what happened because the most progressive areas in the country absolutely refused to close schools. So um, the least progressive, there, there were some places that closed schools, um, but the average school closure was 56 days. And then um, New York City, Chicago, and New Haven as kind of progressive bastions, though they were told by the federal government, you know what, we don't know what's going on, close your schools. They said absolutely not, because out of a million people in New York, a million children in New York in the, in, um, in the public school system, 750,000 lived in tenements. They said school is a place for food, to evaluate for abuse, to evaluate to, to um, people can wash their hands and um, we can ensure hygiene and we also need to keep an eye on them. And they you know, absolutely declined. They took a lot of uh, uh, heat for this, but they absolutely declined. And this is a very interesting kind of his, history um, paper about this, that why the progressive regions in the United States to, um, refused to close schools because it was such an important place for low-income children. Um, and then same with the progressive places in different, um, this is the paper that if you want to read, it's just called Better Off in School. Um, and then the same thing happened in, in um, Canada, that they were teaching children to blow their noses uh, to get out uh, anything, um, but they, but they you know, definitely stayed open because Canada was very progressive at the time. Um, and then Berkeley did close its schools temporarily, but again, 56 days was the average. A lot of outside learning, um, masks. Um, Sometimes, sometimes not. And there were these kind of cloth, larger masks. Um, and then uh, afterwards, this really spawned the school nurse movement. So even in between, this is when nurses got established in schools and school lunch programs and how important the idea of ventilation is for respiratory pathogens. So this is very different around the world. Um, actually, the two places that had the most prolonged school closures were North America and Brazil. And then unfortunately, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So those are the five, and the Philippines, sorry. So those are the six countries that had the most prolonged school closures. And it depended on the, on the state um, in the United States. Uh, the UNICEF was very angry at the WHO throughout this whole thing. And they were saying, talk more about schools because in um, March of 2021, they predicted that 168 million children were out of school um, over that first exact year of the pandemic. And then their latest update is from January, 2022. And still at that point, 616 million students either had left school completely, there were still some school closures or they just couldn't find them. And that's basically where the current state of the data is. Um, and then 70% uh, in low and middle income countries have um, of 10 year olds are now unable to read um, because of these school closures. And then the learning loss in the United States um, was most reported from the states here, including California, Maryland, North Carolina, Texas, Tennessee, Virginia, Ohio. Um, in Brazil, one out of 10 students never said, you know, even when they said, they said, when you opened, which they just opened, we won't return. Um, and a lot of mental health effects as well. And um, school lunches. 
So this is the distribution of school closures across the country. California was 50 out of 50 in reopening. Oregon was next, then Maryland, then Washington, then Hawaii, um, and then New Mexico, and then it goes up from there. However, we luckily did know that schools didn't seem to be major um, places of transmission. Uh, even prior to this through CDC data from North Carolina, from Utah, from New York, from Wisconsin, from Georgia, um, and from Chicago. So these are all the summary of the studies, but it was really, if there were school transmission, it was more parents to, sorry, staff to children, um, and there were variability of mitigation procedures, but not major places of transmission. So we knew that pretty early on um, in this pandemic. And so this has led to the um, Surgeon General in December 2021 to declare a mental health crisis in our youth that I know um, California is working on in terms of mental health uh, services. Uh, in um, the winter of 2021-2022, Massachusetts launched a huge program of test to stay of if we test to, and then if you're negative, you get to stay does that improve outcomes? And they essentially showed that out of 503,000 COVID tests, that all of, almost all of them were negative, speaking to this transmission within schools issue being low. And so the policy lab at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania stopped in January 2022 recommending asymptomatic testing in schools. And I think that asymptomatic testing can keep children out of school a lot. Um, so LA Unified School District had asymptomatic testing starting in the fall of 2021 when they opened. San Francisco Unified School District did not, and half of LA children in LA Unified School District were out of school. Um, and just as a historical point, the idea of quarantines, which is you know only when you're exposed and keeping people out of society is actually extremely um, controversial. It came from keeping in Italy, keeping people, sailors out at sea for 40 days to make sure they didn't have the Black Plague and brought it in. But it's it's something that this is a CDC paper saying it all. you always have to consider the political, ethical, and socioeconomic issues of mass quarantines. So this is a piece I wrote with um, the head of pediatric ID at uh, University of Chicago, where we kind of try to put it all together in January 2022, vaccination, mass mandates when the CDC released them, which they did in February 2022. They based it on hospitalizations there. No more asymptomatic testing because CHOP had um, really put that data nicely together. Symptom-based management, stay home when sick, ventilation, which we're not working hard enough on, and then um, no quarantines, and restoring joy to school. So this comes brings us to the idea of vaccines. And one thing that I really want to mention is that we have the ones that we always hear about, which are Moderna, Pfizer, and then we had Johnson & Johnson, and now we have Novavax. But actually, the world has really great vaccines that um, you can get in other countries. The WHO has approved, actually, eight vaccines. They have not approved the Sputnik V, even though it's, it's actually a good vaccine. Um, but these are the eight vaccines that are approved by um, except for Sputnik V by the World Health Organization. And what are these different types of vaccines? Except for three of them, which are called Covaxin, which is in India, Sinopharm and Sinovac, which are in China. Those are all whole virus vaccines. The remaining six, because there's really nine if we include Sputnik V, all involve the spike protein. So it's somehow connecting the, this is the virus, you know, the piece of the virus that sticks out and, and connects to the ACE2 receptor on the host cell. And what I mean by involving the spike protein is they all do it differently. Novavax is the most traditional. It's actually just a protein with an adjuvant. Um, so the protein itself, like we used to do diphtheria, pertussis, um, and uh, tetanus. And the two mRNA vaccines code for the spike protein. So they code for the you know, the element of protein that's the spike protein. And, and I mean, it's basically the mRNA and then of course it gets in the body and then you produce really high levels of the spike protein and that creates such a powerful response. And then the spike protein totally dissipates and so does the mRNA, it goes away. And then same with the DNA vaccines. These are the Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca and Sputnik V all work one stream, you know, one, one step upstream from mRNA vaccines. They're the DNA that gets made into mRNA. And then again, you produce high levels of the spike protein from that mRNA. All the genetic material dies. 
and so does the protein, and then you have a good immune response. And one thing that sometimes is lost in our booster campaigns are the ideas of antibodies versus cellular immunity. So of course, vaccines don't just generate antibodies, they generate T cells, both CD4 and CD8 cells, and CD4 cells specifically, they um, generate Th1 cells, which are the ones that really um, work on intracellular pathogens like viruses, not Th2. And then they generate B cells. And um, the B cells are responsible for making more antibodies if you see the virus again with help from the T cells. And how did we know that the vaccines generated T cells? Because T cells are really hard to measure. Well, every single one of the trials, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson Johnson, every one of them, if you can see in column four, took the trouble because we had modern technology to not just measure antibodies, but to measure T cells. So either like did flow cytometry to measure them directly, or they actually did interferon gamma assays, but every single one of these um, vaccines, these are in the phase one, two trials of the vaccines, generate really strong T cell responses. And to put it really simply, T cells to protect you from severe disease. So column six shows that in the clinical trials of all the vaccines, that um, severe disease, the protection for against severe disease, these were in adults, are 100, was 100%. Then with time, two things happen. With time, antibodies come down and your T cell response will protect you from severe disease, but antibodies are what's needed up here in the nasal cavity. And that's why we had so many more mild infections starting with Delta. And the second is the mRNA that's in these vaccines or the DNA was directed against the ancestral strain up till now. So combination of those two and these and the variants, they kept on um, evolving to become more and more transmissible. And most of their variation was in the spike protein. So the antibodies didn't work as well, but the T cells worked well. So what would I mean by that? This is how I explain it actually. Um, I will explain it like there's a block of houses. So it's like a hundred houses and every night these T cozies come and protect the houses. And the T cells, there's so many T cells that line up across the spike protein that even if you have 32 mutations with Omicron or BA1, or you have 35 with Omicron BA2, 12, 1, or you even have 39 with the Omicron BA5, there's hundreds of T cells that line up across that spike protein. So you are protected, at least from severe disease, from T cell immunity, even as the variants emerge. So this is a very nice paper in cell. And I think look, the people who've done such amazing work is at, they're at the La Jolla Institute of Immunology in San Diego. But essentially SARS-CoV-2 vaccination induces T cells able to cross-recognize variants from alpha to Omicron. So we have not yet had T cell evasion from our vaccines, the T cells that get generated even with the old vaccines. And now we have updated ones. We haven't yet seen T cell evasion just because there's so many T cells that, that march across that um, that spike protein. And so we have seen very good protection against severe disease, but we've seen with the emergence of the variants, massively a reduction in the ability of vaccines to protect us against what antibodies help us with, IgA and so forth, which is the, the more mild infections up here. This was data from New York um, during Delta that showed vaccine effectiveness against severe disease actually was totally intact with two doses, but over 65 really needed that third dose um, during Delta because the other thing about immunity is beyond the T cells, what about the B cells? So what do the B cells do? So the B cells take uh, with aid from the T cells to make more antibodies. And the amazing part, and these are some nice studies, um, they actually produce antibodies directed against the variant they see. They see Delta, they'll make Delta antibodies. They see Omicron, they'll make Omicron antibodies because the memory B cells aren't pre-stuffed with antibodies. They you know, adapt their antibodies to what they see. But there are people who need that, who cannot wait that time for the antibody response, who cannot let it go into the lungs and um, you know, have not that lack of an antibody response. And in general, it's in general older individuals who um, really require boosters for it. And I'll explain that and the data on boosters in a minute. Let's go back to the variants for a minute. So there was alpha, there were beta, there was beta and gamma stayed kind of in their regions. Alpha, as you know, worldwide variant. Actually, by the way, there was a D614G mutation even before alpha, but then they started naming them by letters. So alpha and delta were the more worldwide variants. 
And then, and, and they were equally virulent to each other. Delta was as virulent as alpha as shown by a large CDC study. And then Omicron came along. And Omicron um, was very interesting. It was identified on Thanksgiving Day, remember 20, November 26, 2021. In South Africa, they have amazing genomic surveillance. They did so much great work during the pandemic. And there were some strange things about Omicron, 32 mutations in the BA1 subvariant across the spike protein and, um, and a lot more antibody evasion, lots more mild infections, a lot more transmissible. In vitro and also in explant lung cell data, they don't seem to infect lung cells as well. And there was a massive amount of infections. In fact, probably 75% of the planet has seen Omicron. Um, at least that's by an IHME model. And there was a JAMA paper recently that showed that 56% of people who are infected don't even know they're infected, they're asymptomatic. So the millions of Omicron infections we've had, it's hard to estimate. Um, but the one good thing about seeing the, the virus on top of your vaccination is that it induces immunity across multiple parts of the virus. And we'll talk about hybrid immunity in a bit. So who did the boost, the first booster benefit and who did the four shot benefit and who will the Omicron specific BA4, BA5 bivalent likely benefit? Well, at least the data from the CDC by February 18th um, through the Delta surge, it looked like those over 65 benefited the most, and there was definitely some benefit for a third dose, those over 50. There was a New England Journal study in December that showed no benefit to 18 to 29 year olds for getting three doses versus two doses. Then, um, then, the, the, then different countries rolled out the fourth shot. And this was around spring, this was of course spring of 2022. And different countries did it differently. Europe said over 80, the US said over 50. But there was a New England Journal study that looked at the four shot in healthcare workers and found no benefit for less than 60. So we were close, 50, 60, but at least that was where we knew about the fourth shot. And what do we know about the fifth shot or the fifth shot or the Gomicron specific? Well, I think we have to identify who's at risk for severe breakthroughs, because at some point we are going to refine our booster strategy. It's unlikely that we're going to give boosters every three to six months or even once a year to everyone. Um, so who is most at risk for severe breakthroughs? Well, there is no doubt that being vaccinated, um, this is adults, but this is this this is um, up to December 2021, was massively protective um, all the way through the Omicron BA1 surge. Being vaccinated mattered. And the risk factors for having a severe breakthrough, and this was data up through Delta, was being older, over 75 with four comorbidities or having severe immunocompromise. So these were the populations that were really being focused on for the fourth shot um, in spring in Europe. And then what do we know about this fifth shot? Um, I would just say, and there's you know some controversy in the field, it's BA4, BA5 specific. It's, it, but it also unfortunately has the ancestral strain in it, which I'm not sure why, because it's so long gone. Um, and it's being recommended for everyone 12 and up, and they're even making a formulation for five to 11 year olds. But um, the, the, when I talk about Paxlovid later on, right now, who's most at risk for severe breakthroughs are 65 and older. So I think a campaign like Canada that's kind of starting with older people with that fifth shot, they have a BA1 bivalent, may be um, more effective because only 71% of our over 65 year olds in this country have gotten a third shot. Okay, so pediatric COVID vaccine. I pulled out this morning the doses because it actually really confused me about the doses and I wanted to make sure that I really understood it. For six months to two years, it's three micrograms times three. This is the primary series for um, Pfizer. And it's so much different for Moderna, 25 micrograms times two. And when I mentioned the trials, you'll see there were more side effects with the Moderna than there were with the Pfizer. But on the other hand, you have to do three doses with the Pfizer. And then two to five years, it's 25 micrograms times two shots um, for Moderna. And for two to four years, it's three micrograms times three shots. So it goes all the way up to just under five for the three times three for Pfizer. Then the five to 11 year old vaccine is 10 micrograms times two shots. And then after that, everything is the same. For Pfizer, it's 30 micrograms, whether you're 12 or whether you're 60. And for Moderna, it's 10 micrograms times two shots for, um, 
uh, for 12 years, sorry, it, sorry, it's 100 micrograms times two shots from 12 and up. So there are some countries that have um, been concerned about that higher dose of Moderna between 12 and 17 year olds um, and haven't approved that higher dose of Moderna um, uh, and, and prefer kind of the, the 30 microgram dose in the 12 to 17 year olds for Pfizer. So these are the different dosings. Oh, it's stuck. Let me be, sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so in terms of the five to 11 year old vaccine, this was the initial data. There were three infections with the vaccine and 16 with placebo. So that was given 90% efficacy. There was no severe disease in either the placebo or the, um, the vaccine group. But on the other hand, data that was gone, went through Omicron really showed that there was an improvement with outcomes having been vaccinated. And fundamentally, and I wrote this with a, some, a pediatrician from University of Virginia, any child dying is unacceptable. And so, but one problem in comparing now and trying to do vaccine trials or booster trials is there's been so much natural immunity and now I'll explain seroprevalence in a couple of slides that it's there, the comparison group becomes harder than at the beginning of the pandemic where you really were working with people who had nucleocapsid antibodies that were negative. So some, some of these studies are really hard. In terms of the two vaccines for six months to two-year-olds, just in general, um, these are the sizes of the trials. Um, the, they had really good antibody responses. That's really what got them approved. It was really, quote, immunobridging data. It wasn't based really on infections, though there was decreased infections with the vaccines, no severe disease. But there was a lot more local site reactions with the Moderna. Um, and there was a febrile seizure in the Moderna group. So it's kind of that balance of three doses versus two and the more side effects, because there certainly was more injection site reactions with the higher dose. And then finally, and I think this is just something this country should have done, and we eventually did, but I wish we had done it early, is that UK, Canada, and India always spaced out the two doses by eight weeks. And the reason they did that is we had limited vaccine supply. It's like the monkeypox vaccine right now, putting it intradermally. So they wanted to save more lives to get that T cells up in older people. But then beyond that, it's just sort of a principle of vaccinology. The longer you wait between doses, the better. The only three week regimen we've ever given is rabies vaccine. Usually there's you know, at least two to three months between or up to six months between doses. So this was a nice study in cell in October, 2021 that showed that giving the Pfizer vaccine three weeks apart did not generate as good of an antibody and T cell response because you want those long lasting T cells then giving it eight weeks apart. And so that was also shown from data from Canada who from the get-go, except in healthcare workers and immunocompromised, gave the doses eight weeks apart. And they had much fewer breakthroughs with the Delta wave. And they also had a lower rate of myocarditis um, in young men, it typically occurs less than 30, much lower rate by just spacing out those doses by seven to eight weeks. Um, and so I think that's a strategy that that I wish we uh, could have adopted earlier. I wrote a couple of pieces in MedPage saying, please you know, extend that vaccine dosing. And then the CDC finally did, but it was very interesting how they did it. They, don't, they haven't kind of made a lot of fanfare about it. Um, so they do say three to eight weeks. They don't actually say eight weeks. They say three to eight weeks, but at least it allows for that eight weeks. And it's basically in anyone except if you're immunocompromised. So I think that strategy I think it makes the most sense, especially for um, younger males less than 40, which they do have in the footnote of their, um, of their table. So what about the seroprevalence in children at this point? So April 26, there was this large seroprevalence study that was published by the CDC and it got a lot of attention because 60% of adults and 75% of children zero to 18 had nucleocapsid antibodies. Nucleocapsid of course means that it's natural infection because the spike, um, protein at IgG, it's what's generated by both natural and the vaccine. And then the latest data goes up to May 2022. It's called the Nationwide Commercial Lab Pediatric Antibody Seroprevalence Study. And now 79.7% children of children have had natural infection. 
So comparing doing a vaccine or a booster trial right now is very difficult on the setting of so much natural immunity. And what, what does hybrid immunity show us? Or what do the studies of hybrid immunity tell us? And what is hybrid? It's getting a vaccine and then getting an infection or getting an infection and a vaccine. I again would refer you to um, Shane Quaddy from the La Jolla in, in, um, Immunology Institute. He has done really pivotal work on how powerful hybrid immunity is. I wrote a paper in clinical infectious diseases to try to summarize the data through the first BA1 Omicron wave of what was the best, kind of the strongest immunity. And there's simply no question that getting two doses plus an infection or getting an infection plus one dose was stronger than getting two doses of the vaccine. So it makes sense because you see the entire virus and you can develop antibodies and T cells across parts of the virus beyond the spike protein, which is mutating so much over time. So this hybrid immunity is strong and it is real. So where are we in the world then? Um, well, we have vaccines. We have 68% of the world's population having received one dose. We have the fact that this was the most transmissible BA1, then BA2, then BA2.12.1, then BA4, then BA5. And there's some BA275 um, as well and some BA7 coming. So we've had a lot of subvariants of Omicron. So we've had a lot of natural infection as well. And we are at the lowest point of deaths um, than we've ever seen since March of 2020. So when the Dr. Tedros said the end is in sight on September 14th, in no way did he say that we don't have to keep on working on the pandemic. Because when now, now I'm next going to talk about what makes a virus or a pathogen eradicable. And if something is not eradicable, which only smallpox has, it there is another virus, by the way, rinderpest in cattle was eradicated, but they killed the cattle. So we're not, you know, that's not a good strategy. So, but there are two viruses that have been massively, you know, eradicated from the planet, but only two. And um, if it's not eradicable, any endemic stage of a disease does not mean that we give up. And so I thought this was a really nice graphic that the CDC, the, the WHO put out in March of 2022. And you remember what was happening in March, like Dr. Fauci on April 27th said, I think we're out of the emergency phase. Then he said the next day, no, we're not. But the European CDC he said on April 27th, that same day, we're out of the emergency phase and they stayed with it, meaning they went to endemic management on April 27th. So did the UK. And what does endemic management mean? And I think this is for me, the best way to explain it is how the WHO explained it. They said that if a virus is still circulating, that if we are in our baseline scenario where we are now, we're on Omicron. I mean, we're, we're on some variants of Omicron, but we're still Omicron. It's little offshoots of Omicron that every winter, every respiratory pathogen season or when there's a wave, we will need to vaccinate vulnerable people. And they didn't define it specifically, but they essentially wrote later in the document, immunocompromised and over 60. Then they said, what if we got a less virulent variant? Because 29 species of animals can contain COVID. Remember when they killed all those mink in, in Denmark? So there's a lot of animals that contain COVID. So what if we got something emerging from nature somewhere less virulent? Then they said that would become the booster. And then there's a worst case scenario. And if, if a more virulent variant emerges, sigma or something that's more virulent, then we would need to boost everyone because whether you're young or old, you need, that, you need that boost of higher antibodies. And of course, if we have specific mRNA vaccines towards what's circulating, all the better. So that was their strategy on March of 2022. So then this brings me to the final topic before we have time for questions, which is what, what is in typical infectious disease epidemiology, what are the words that we use to describe where we are with a pathogen. And the words are actually, there is a pandemic phase, but then after that, there's a phase of control and everyone decides differently and everyone has decided differently. The UK decided in March that they're in control. Um, elimination means that you reduce it to zero within a particular area. So for example, the monkeypox outbreak, which started May 12th, the, the WHO has now said that we're likely to eliminate it in Europe 
and the US and Canada and Australia and all these places where it isn't in animals. And I agree with that. But it has been in rodent populations in West and Central Africa for since 1958 when it was first described. So we'll never eliminate if it's still around, but you have to use the word control. By the way, we haven't given any vaccines to West and Central Africa during this outbreak. So the only way to get under control is vaccination. Then eradication means permanent reduction to zero worldwide. That's smallpox. That did happen for smallpox. But smallpox is not extinct. That would be the final thing. And that would be if we went into these labs in Moscow, the UK, and the US, and we destroyed those samples. But those are still around. So it's actually not extinct, but it has been eradicated. And what were the four features of smallpox that allowed eradication? Actually, unfortunately, COVID doesn't have any of them. They are no animal reservoirs. The next one we want to back, uh, eradicate, by the way, is polio. And it's not that it has no animal reservoirs, but it only has primate reservoirs. But when you have 29 species of animals and counting, like COVID, it's impossible to eradicate. Um, actually, mink were killed in Denmark. Hamsters were killed in Hong Kong. Cats and dogs were killed in China. But you can't kill all the animals. So, okay, so animal reservoirs is very important. Second is clear pathogenic features. You knew this was smallpox. There's nothing else it could be. COVID looks like influenza, human metanumovirus, parainfluenza, everything else. Short period of infectiousness. COVID has pre-symptomatic spread. And then you were immune for life if you got COVID, I'm sorry, if you got smallpox. And if you got the vaccine, you were immune for a long time. But unfortunately, getting COVID does not make you immune for life. So it's actually those four features that make it a non-eradicable virus. So then how do you control a non-eradicable virus? Well, vaccination alone is useful for something like measles. But if we can get a therapeutic, it's way better to try to control it with vaccines and therapeutics. And so pertussis is a good example because pertussis has a good vaccine, but a neonate where the, the mother didn't get pertussis vaccination during a pregnancy is still susceptible to pertussis. And luckily we have um, macrolides to treat it with. So it'd be much better to have therapeutics and vaccinations. So what about the therapeutics? I think these are a very big deal. I think molnupiravir, which is a nucleoside analog, kind of you know, blocking like NRTIs um, in, in HIV was the first um, one to be studied. And then Paxlovid um, is the protease inhibitor. So this is where you've you know, already made a big polyprotein of the virus and it has to be cut up into little pieces to make little baby SARS-CoV-2 and Paxlovid inhibits that. So it's a protease, protease inhibitor. And what do we knew, know about molnupiravir? Even though the original trials didn't look amazing, actually it showed a 30% reduction in all cause hospitalizations and deaths among those who are unvaccinated at risk for severe disease. That was the trial. The trial was only studied among unvaccinated, but there was a recent paper in the New England Journal about molnupiravir in vaccinated, and it was very helpful, 80% in reducing severe disease for immunocompromised and vaccinated. So think about it more, because I feel like we've really focused in on Paxlovid, which has some drug-drug interactions, but I think molnupiravir is a good drug. There were three major trials for Paxlovid. They were Epic HR, which means that you were unvaccinated at risk for severe disease. That was an amazing trial, 89% reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. Unfortunately, Epic SR, which is like your standard risk, you get COVID, but you don't really go on to be very sick. They had to stop early because there was no efficacy. And then Epic PEP, where you're infected and you give someone Paxlovid who's in the household to prevent them from getting infected, there was no efficacy of Epic PEP. So those two trials had to be closed. But we're not giving Paxlovid to just the unvaccinated. We're giving Paxlovid to vaccinated. So what, what is the data there? And this is really the best data. This was published last month in the New England Journal from Israel that across a large population 106,000 people got COVID in this one healthcare uh, system in Israel. 3,000 got Paxlovid, and it was really those over 65 that you still had. It was like the same proportion. It was 89% reduction in hospitalization and death. The HR was 0.21. No benefit from 40 to 64. So I think if we really want to refine its use, it's for older people. And then this comes back to my next point. If I were in charge of the booster campaign, I'd be more targeting this population, 65 and older, because I think they, they really need it. They are absolutely at risk for more severe breakthroughs. 
Okay. And then the final thing is monoclonal. And I recognize in the pediatric population, you have monoclonal antibodies, but you do not have Paxlovid. And so I'm sorry about that. Um, and these, you know, it, it's only approved for, the, for, I think, I'm almost sure it's 12 and up. Um, so, uh, so the monoclonal antibodies, at least Evu shelled, actually works really well. The one thing we're concerned about is one circulating variant that was in India in June, and it, it really didn't cause any damage, but it was BA275. Evu shell doesn't work against this. So we have to watch for emerging variants and create monoclonal antibodies based on these variants. Um, I should mention that remdesivir can be used down to very tiny young ages. Um, and I, I think it's three kilograms. So this was kind of our rational roadmap to future COVID management that we published in March, stopping mass asymptomatic testing, which the um, CDC did endorse in August, stopping quarantines, but isolating when you're sick, investing really heavily in tests to treat, stopping vaccine passports that were really divisive, spacing out the initial doses of vaccine by eight weeks. I really am interested in Covaxin someday coming here, or at least us having a whole virus vaccine, because it'd be really nice to see the whole virus because the spike protein keeps on mutating. And I was actually in India and I got Covaxin because I was very, wanted it. Um, and then I think stressing the studies from Israel about how important vaccination is to reduce long COVID. And in fact, this was just published in Nature on September 4th, 2022, that showed that people who had even two doses of the vaccine reported the same long COVID symptoms cognitive on as people who had never had COVID at all. But that wasn't true with one dose and nor was it true of zero doses. And then ventilation, I think is very important. And then I do think that masks are extremely controversial and um, I would do recommendations and not this is my idea, um, recommendations and not mandates, because it, it really created some controversy. And this kind of aligned with what the president said on March 2nd, when he enrolled their plan for endemic management, vaccines, deciding on vaccine strat booster strategies, prophylaxis for immunocompromised individuals, test and treat, wastewater surveillance, and then pandemic recovery and thinking about how to recover offices and schools, and then global vaccine equity, which unfortunately has been blocked um, in funding, but it's incredibly important. In terms of masks, I'll just mention that to wear a mask, um, the most effective masks, at least these are in physical mannequin studies, are really KN95s, N95s, FFP2s, KF94s that come in children's sizes. But the polypropylene mask of the surgical mask, it does have um, negative charges, which repels the virus, but it's not as good as something stronger. Um, and then, uh, and then, um, and then cloth masks haven't seemed to have so much effectiveness. And states that had mask or with or without mask mandates after vaccination didn't seem to have different outcomes. And it's kind of this data that made the CDC in February change their recommendations to wear masks in the setting of where, how the hospitals were doing and not in the setting of cases. At any rate, they're still recommended for vulnerable individuals. So I'll end with how are we doing as medical providers in terms of our trust from the public? Because I don't think we used a harm reduction approach as much as we did in HIV. And what I mean by harm reduction is, is that you figure out which interventions are causing the least harm and do those, like close bars, close restaurants, but don't close schools. And so that's what I meant by the word harm reduction. And I just wrote a book for Mayo Clinic Press on harm reduction and what we could have learned from HIV for COVID. And because of that, we have non increased non-COVID related deaths in many populations. It's from homicides, suicides, overdoses, road related injuries, alcohol. There has been consequences of some of these, these lockdowns. And um, there's an estimate that there have been 12 million deaths from delaying medical care with 6 million deaths from COVID. And so what can we do to increase trust? Well, luckily the public is not mad at us. So the public actually trusts their providers. And so it is this one-on-one -on -one interaction that we have with our patients that helps with vaccination, with Evusheld, with taking therapeutics. Right now, the public has decreasing trust in our public health system. So in May, a Pew poll said 50%, that was last May. Then January, 44% of Americans trust the CDC, and now we're at 32%. So we have had a decrease in trust in public health. 
And that decrease in trust and closing medical care has consequences. So um, UNICEF, which again, I, 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 this is like the main organization I give to now because I feel like they've been so propounding for children throughout this pandemic, is that they um, report 25 million to a backslide in child immunization rates that is that is more, the worst than they've ever seen in three decades. So 25 million infants missed out on life-saving vaccination. And you know that we have polio um, here in New York. It's in the wastewater. We had one case of paralytic polio in a 18-year-old who was unvaccinated. He had gone to Europe and maybe been, ex well, he was exposed to an OPV strain, an oral polio vaccine strain that unfortunately reverted. It only happens one in 2.4 million times. It was very unlucky, but he did, there was a reversion and OPV is circulating. We're actually one of few countries where OPV is circulating in our wastewater. And then just across the planet, we're seeing measles and polio both. So measles, a terrible outbreak is occurring right now in Zimbabwe. So this is my kind of final slide. This is the strategy in this book um, that I we kind of propose to how to like visit any pandemic, which is accelerating vaccination. That's the first thing to do. And now we have this mRNA technology where we can do that. Ease restrictions when things get better, meaning if there are vaccines, ease restrictions because that increases trust, like masks. Emphasizing education and harm reduction, what can we close, what can we not close. Encouraging the outside, that's good for every respiratory pathogen. Schools are important for children. Avoiding lockdowns until you, in, as soon as you figured out how to um, work on the virus and, and masks and distancing and ventilation, that's when you can reopen with these mitigation strategies in place de-emphasizing anything that doesn't work, like deep cleaning, like take them, take it away immediately if it doesn't work, that increases trust. Um, and then reassess testing as we go along, like the asymptomatic testing issue, expand treatment, so work on treatments with vaccinations, and then we come to the other cycle, preparing for future pandemic. So that's, um, I think, where we are. So I will actually end there. Um, and um, again, the reason the UK declared it endemic, by the way, in March is because they had very good data in the UK because their National Health Service that the mortality from COVID was less than that of the flu. Um, and so um, I think we'll always be dealing with it. Like, as I always say, um, my life is irrevocably changed. And so is your as, as in the meta as a being a doctor. But when do we let the public's life not be irrevocably changed is, is the question that I think everyone's been grappling with now. And in general, there's very, everything's pretty open. Okay, thank you. So much, that was a long awaited and I'm so glad that we have you talk about this, so informative. It's open for questions. Um, if you have a question, please say, um, say it and then if you can repeat it because we don't have Okay. A and do we look in the chat? And I can look in the chat. Okay. Anyone has questions on the chat? Yes, okay. Um, so my question is more about, you, you alluded to the fact that over the last couple of years, being an expert in the field who's read the literature, your opinion sometimes deviated from CDC and sort of the national recommendations. Do you have tips for people like when they have those sort of differing opinions or lessons that you learned for how to navigate that space? No, I think it was really awful. I mean, actually I was really attacked and it was really awful. And but I couldn't help myself. And I'll I'll just be really clear why. My husband died three months before the pandemic from cancer. I had two young children. They were out of school. And I felt it was an incredibly privileged space to be in to have two parents at home with children. And so my personal experiences informed my feelings about school closures. And the second thing that informed it was how much HIV didn't do this. We never shamed people for getting HIV. We didn't call them COVID idiots. We didn't use the word that you're bad because you got COVID. In fact, Reagan did that and it made us so mad. It made us so mad when the conservatives would, would stigmatize an infection. And we closed bathhouses, but we didn't tell people not to, to have sex. And so I couldn't help myself. I just don't know how to explain it. Like I've been an HIV doctor for 20 years and I just know that the progressives were the one who used harm reduction 
And the conservatives were the one who said, abstinence only, stay away. You can't have sex if there's HIV out there, and especially if you're gay. And I couldn't reconcile that it had flipped so much during COVID. So no, I have no tips. I was totally attacked, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> but if I can make a comment about that, and I hope people on Zoom can. Uh, I have learned a lot from this, and I've learned that we actually uh, are all kind of guilty from very easily going into what we sometimes call cancel culture and say polarized issues rather than engaging in the debate. And Monica and I have known each other for a long, long time, so we could actually talk about it and we made a decision together to postpone Grand Rounds to not set the whole house on fire. Um, but it's, uh, I think we really wanted to actually make Grand Rounds much more of a space for a debate and not a, like, you can't come and talk here because you don't agree with some of the people in that community. So I really appreciate that you came back here to share your thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Lot and then Mindy, and then there's someone on Zoom. Okay. Monica, thank you so much for coming and um, keeping grand rounds for us. Thank you. I guess a question that I have, which is a little bit similar, is um, I think COVID has taught me that you know, I've been wrong quite a few times. And I guess, how do we recover from being so certain? And so, like, maybe a little off the mark on some things. And, you know, do you have any advice for rebuilding sometimes? You know, like, yes, we have one on one um, relationships with our patients, but how do we rebuild this sort of um, after being a little incorrect in some ways? I think that's such a great question, and you can hear a little bit of this happening. So the CDC in on August 18th, the CDC director said, I get it, like, you don't trust us. And we, um, we had data transparency issues. The school opening guidelines seemed really off in February 2021 because they weren't consistent with things that we had published, that even in areas of high community transmission, you could still open schools and there's questions of unions and whatnot. And so she said, Dr. Walensky said, I'm going to, I promise we're gonna change. <laughs> um, and we're going to start a whole process of transparency. And, and I thought that was incredibly important. And I was asked by news stations, like, should she be fired? And I said, no way, like what an incredible thing to do is to say, like, sometimes we messed up and I'm sorry. Well, she didn't say I'm sorry, but she said we messed up. And then you can hear Dr. Collins and Dr. Fauci over the last week, it's just over the last week, saying we should have been more transparent when things changed. Like, mask data, well, I mean, I was so into masks, like, I was really into them. Um, and I put out a lot of papers about masks, that's all I talked about. But then they didn't work as well as like vaccines. And it's really okay to like say that. And so I feel like um, there's one other thing and I did talk to the White House. I said, I think like admitting you're wrong, being transparent when you're wrong, saying I'm sorry. And I do think there's sometimes we should apologize. And I think it would be helpful to just anyone when we get it wrong is to apologize. I've done many things wrong during the pandemic. And I uh, there was one thing I did about India that I thought they had more immunity, they did. And I apologized multiple times on Twitter because I was wrong. Um, so I think apologize. I think that'll help increase trust. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I love you. Share with my patients and people in my community. I think that's a very good question because part of the, the workforce burnout is also loneliness and like not being around each other, which is why President Biden in March said like, let's get back to the offices and to school. Um, because 
I think part of our workforce burnout was that we were being criticized by the public because we were representing the medical establishment. I've been called a pharmacy shill or so many times I can't even count, like for pushing vaccines. And so you're being yelled at and then you're like trying to do something and then like you're not around your your coworkers and it depends on whether there's burnout. There's no doubt that gathering or being together is more, you, there's more susceptibility to respiratory pathogens. And so the question is, when do you balance that in the face of vaccinations? And when do you, when, what do you make, what are the reasons for burnout? Are people missing each other? Are they lonely? Yesterday, the US Preventative Task Force, not yesterday, a couple of days ago said, everyone should be screened for anxiety under 65. We are depressed. I mean, the, our society is anxious and depressed. And part of that has to do with being away from each other. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I know it's one o'clock, but I wonder if you have a couple more minutes, because I think there's a couple questions on the um, Zoom that people are really interested in um, hearing the answer to. One is um, Dr. Robert Pantel asked, is there any evidence that school closures did anything to protect elderly household members of school age children? Actually, there was a study in the UK um, that showed the opposite. Um, and the reason is because if you close schools, often the parents had to work and then the children were around um, grandparents. So there was actually, a, I'll send it around when you, you, and you can feel free to send this out, but there was a JAMA article that it did the opposite. It, um, and then Dr. Robert Kleinman asked, for immunocompromised individuals, how often and how long would you recommend administering Abershell prophylaxis? And how are you defining immunocompromised? Well, that's a great question. I didn't get to actually cover this paper, but um, I wrote a piece for Medscape, which I would really love it if people read that actually these vaccines work really well. Like you're not that, I mean, we kind of act like they don't work that well, but these are bizarrely amazing vaccines. Like you get so much protein from the mRNA that they work really well. So actually there was a CID study that showed only two populations didn't respond very well to the vaccines, having B, being on B cell depleting therapy or being a solid organ transplant recipient. And there was just a CID paper this week that three doses restored protection for solid organ transplant participants. So it's really now B cell depleting therapies to the, mo the least uh, uh, able to mount a good response to the vaccines. And they should get Evusheld. My father was on B cell lymphoma treatment. So he got Evusheld every six months until he recovered every six months. And then last question, um, I don't know who this is, but someone asked, do you have any thoughts about the potential utility for an intranasal COVID-19 vaccine? Yes, I think this is really important because the other thing is that I think I have at this point convinced us that vaccines are amazing for severe disease, but they're not, I, many people probably in this room have had COVID and, and they are not as good against mild reinfections. So what we need is IgA right here. We need it up in our nasal cavity because um, there was a recent study that showed vaccines reduce transmission by 21%. So it's not like they don't reduce transmission. Infection reduces by 21% and hybrid immunity reduces by 42%. Because what hybrid immunity does is the infection gives you temporarily more IgA. So the only way to stop all infections is to get IG, is to have an intranasal vaccine, like in that movie Contagion. Remember, they weren't giving the vaccine here; they were giving it in the nose. Um, the one problem with that is those are also going to come down. So fundamentally, you'd have to get, we'd have to figure out the frequency. There's actually India has an intranasal vaccine, a product, um, and how much to give that often, and then how much to give the intramuscular, because you still want your T cells, B cells. Thank you so much for watching. Those of you on Zoom, I said this uh, last time, the first uh, in-person one, it was a small, very cool group of people, and the cool people group is growing, so if you want to be part of that, <laughs> come in person, share some community, in a couple of weeks, we actually will have lunch again, so uh, that will be an advertising piece, and I now feel good about having lunch. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much. Let's get back to it.